Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for tonight's David Elder Lecture, which is hosted in partnership with the University of Strathclyde. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted you could join us for the first lecture of 2022, uh, and I do hope you enjoy this evening. My name is Nina. I'm the Planetarium Coordinator here at Glasgow Science Centre, and I'll be introducing uh, our speaker and also hosting the live Q&A portion after the lecture. Um, so, as I said shortly, I'll be introducing our guest speaker, and after watching her lecture, I'm sure you'll have plenty of questions for her. Uh, so to ask those questions, as always, you just pop them into the YouTube comments box or the Facebook chat and my producer Yvonne will make sure that they all get to me. Um, so just to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, we've got Dr. Alice Gorman, who is an internationally recognised leader in the field of space archaeology. Uh, and she's also the author of the award winning book, Dr. Space Junk versus the Universe, Archaeology and the Future. Just finished reading it. I would heartily recommend it. Um, her research focuses on the archaeology and heritage of space exploration, which includes space junk, planetary landing sites, off earth mining and space habitats. She's an associate professor at Flinders University in Adelaide uh, and a heritage consultant with over 25 years experience working with Indigenous communities in Australia. Gorman is also a vice chair of the Global Expert Group on Sustainable Lunar Activities uh, and a member of the Advisory Council of the Space Industry Association of Australia. In 2021, asteroid um, quite a lot of numbers, 551014 Gorman was named after her in recognition of her work in establishing space archaeology as a field. We're absolutely delighted to welcome her from halfway around the globe and across several time zones from a very warm Australia for tonight's lecture, Archaeology on the Moon. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Dr Gorman. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here and I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm talking to you today from the lands of the Wiradjuri people. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and acknowledge their deep and ongoing connections to the cultural heritage of their lands, waters and skies. And I also extend that respect to the traditional owners of any countries that the audience is joining us from today. So um, now is the moment, I think, where I am going to... I'm going to vanish and hand over to you. <laughs> um, ah, so give me a moment while I uh, get my slides up. Can everyone see that? I can no longer see um, the chat or anything, so I'm just going to assume that um, this is visible to everyone and um, I'm going to commence. <clears throat> so my topic tonight is archaeology on the moon. And first of all, I'm going to give you a little very brief snapshot of all of the places that human space activities have left on the moon. There are actually more than 100 locations where there's human material culture, but this is just a, a little brief overview. So we have a, a big range of robotic landers. These include the Soviet Lunar Series, the US Ranger and Surveyor Series, which were used to gather information for the Apollo missions. We also have two Soviet rovers, the Lunacod 1 and 2, and these have been joined in more recent years by the Chang'e series, of which there are three currently on the moon. But it's not just all on the surface. So there are also a number of orbiters that are in lunar orbit. At the moment, there's currently four active ones, and the information is a little unclear at times. So we know that at least 13 have fallen back onto the surface of the moon and created little impact craters, but some of them it's quite difficult to find out information for. So there's a grey area of what's in orbit and what's not in orbit. And of course, the sites that everybody knows the most about, the most famous of all of these lunar sites, are the six Apollo landing sites where uh, humans actually set foot and lived and walked on the surface of the moon. The first one being in 1969 and the last one in 1972. So these are all places that create an archaeological record on the moon. And we should not also forget that the entire moon itself is a cultural artifact. The moon has played a role in human uh, science and society and art and imagination since the first hominids emerged uh, in Africa millions and millions of years ago. So, so we have the large scale of the whole moon as a cultural object and then the finer grained archaeological record of all of these sites and places on its surface. These are not just archaeology. 
they also have enormous cultural heritage significance for nations and communities and individuals on earth. And one way we can start to think about what this heritage significance is, is to apply some very well-tested heritage principles. And the ones I use come from the Australian chapter of the International Council of Monuments and Sites. Uh, the Borough Charter first uh, put together in 1976, current version 2013. The Borough Charter is used all over the world for assessing cultural heritage significance. It has five categories of significance. Historic, which is association with events or people. Scientific, which is basically the kinds of research that we can do on a place and what we can learn from it. Aesthetic is about uh, the engagement of the senses with a place and location, interesting for space. Social is perhaps the most important kind of heritage significance. This is how people form attachments to a, a piece of material culture, to an archaeological site. So it's basically com community esteem in the presence. And of course, there are uh, spiritual beliefs about many places, which don't always have to be about religion, you could argue that lunar conspiracy theorists have very strongly held beliefs about the moon, not technically religion, but it's kind of sort of a spiritual significance. So what happens if we apply these significance principles to places on the moon? So the first one I want to have a look at is, in fact, the very first human object ever to make contact with the moon. And this is the Soviet Lunar 2 space probe. This was launched in 1959, only two years after Sputnik 1, the first ever Earth orbiting satellite, uh, had got into orbit. So this is extraordinary. We went from Earth orbit to the moon in just two years. So this was a crash landing mission. It was always intended to crash. And it had a number of interesting components. So the, the rocket uh, delivered the Lunar 2 probe, which you see on the screen, and it, they both fell on the surface of the moon. The location of the rocket is currently unknown. When it landed, there were three little bombs, almost, you could say. One bomb released a sodium vapour gas, and the idea of this was to make the gas cloud visible from Earth, so no one could accuse the Soviet Union of making this up. And in fact, Bernard Lovell at the Jodrell Bank Telescope did see this cloud of vapour. It, it covered an area of 650 kilometres. There were two other little bombs. They were small balls put together of uh, 72 metallic pentagons inscribed with uh, the date, uh, USSR, and in some cases, the little hammer and sickle insignia. And these had explosives inside. So when they hit the surface of the moon, the little spheres would explode and scatter these little medallions over the surface of the moon. So we don't actually know if that happened or not because the, the image you see on this screen is an artist's impression. It's not a real picture of the landing site. But this is the first time and place humans made it to the moon. And it's a very complex and interesting site that tells us a lot about the attitudes of the time. The medallions particularly are meant to inscribe the moon as a place with a particular ideology. And of course, this is what the Cold War was all about. So I find the Lunar 2 site fascinating. This image you see on the screen shows you the location of the other lunar landing modules from the Soviet lunar series. The Surveyor series, which is in blue writing, and in the yellow writing, you can see the six Apollo missions. So they go Apollo 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, 17. Apollo 18 never happened. And, of course, there's no Apollo 13. Many people have likely seen the film, a uh, very fine film, which shows you how the Apollo 13 mission uh, suffered a critical failure on way to the way to the moon and had to come back. So, again, this is just a tiny portion of all the lunar sites that there are, but I want to focus in a little bit more now on the most famous of them all, the Apollo 11 landing site. So these are some of the scientific installations that are present at that site. P possibly if we imagine Apollo 11, we, we think always of the famous boot print, the first footstep of a human on another world, which you can see in the top picture here. What a lot of people don't know is that the soles of those moon boots were designed as an experiment. 
So when the foot of the astronaut pressed into the soft lunar dust, and at this stage people weren't quite sure how soft and deep that dust was, it would leave these ridged stripes and the angle of the stripes and the way they reflected light would actually convey information about the nature of that top layer of dust. So the footprints themselves were a scientific experiment. Almost the first thing the Apollo 11 crew did when they got out of their spacecraft was go and set up a television camera. And that's what you can see in the bottom right, the little tall, skinny, sticking up thing. So that is the camera that filmed their activities on the two and a half hours they were on the moon and broadcast them back to 600 million people watching on Earth. So in terms of how Apollo 11 engaged a huge global community, I would say this television camera is almost one of the most significant things at this site. The other things in this image you can see in the top middle, the long skinny strip is a Swiss experiment for studying cosmic rays. And it's an interesting reminder that although this mission was funded by the US, there was a lot of international cooperation. And this Swiss designed and manufactured experiment is physical evidence of that. In the middle bottom picture, you see the Lunar Laser Ranger retroreflector. And this is an active ongoing experiment. On the little cubes on the surface of that thing, uh, people are sending laser beams up to bounce off it every day. So you could say, Apollo 11 hasn't been abandoned and discarded. It's still an active, ongoing scientific experiment. The big, complicated, insecty looking thing on the left is a passive seismic experiment with a whole lot of other experiments bundled into it, including one that's fascinating to me, a tiny matchbox sized uh, instrument which was aimed at measuring lunar dust. And it was designed by an Australian scientist, Professor Brian O'Brien. So that's a little piece of Australia on the moon. I think it's important to note that the material culture of Apollo 11 reflects that international cooperation. So let's look at the site in broad overview. Here there are two pictures of Apollo 11 uh, looking from above. The line drawing on the left is pretty much like any archaeological site plan that you would make if you are an archaeologist on Earth going out to record a site. So you can see the television camera up the very top and the sort of angle of view from that. Various craters in the middle is the landing module with the ascent module attached to it. And the blue crescent is uh, a particular area that in archaeological terms we could call a tosso. So this is where the two crew threw everything inside the ascent module that they didn't need to make it light enough to actually take off from the moon. So they, they just chucked everything that was unnecessary out of the window and created this interesting archaeological deposit of, of the same kind, you know, a similar kind we might find on Earth. So the site can become an archaeological site plan. In the other image where you see the orange tracks, this is actually the astronaut traverses. This is where they walked over the two and a half hours. It's actually quite a tiny area, as you will see from the scale. But the distance they travelled reflects their growing comfort with operating in one-sixth Earth gravity with this uh, very distinct light and shade environment and wearing their bulky spacesuits as well. And the fact that we can see these trails from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter suggests that those footprints are mostly still there or in, in, intact in some way. This is the image taken by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, a US uh, satellite around the moon in 2009. So you would like to think that seeing an actual picture of the Apollo 11 site would actually make some of the conspiracy theorists think again about whether the lunar landing missions ever happened. Uh, in which case, you would be incorrect, sadly, uh, because they say the picture is manufactured. But here you can see, particularly by the shadows that they cast, the landing module in the center, you can see some of those little traverses, and you can see some little tiny shadows of some of the other experiments. So this is the Apollo 11 landing site as it probably currently still looks. So those footprints are so evocative and so have such a large role in the imagination of how people think about Apollo 11. But from an archaeological perspective, they're perhaps even more interesting. 
So one of the oldest archaeological sites where we have evidence that human ancestors were walking bipedally uh, 3.7 million years ago is the site of Lytoli in Tanzania. And you might have seen in the news, they just recently discovered some new foot tracks at this place. So this image of, of two human ancestors walking across the soft lava, leaving impressions of their feet, uh, is almost as famous as the Apollo 11 boot prints. So let's leap to 53 years ago. That's how long ago the Apollo 11 mission was. And you similarly have human uh, ancestors as well walking across a soft grey landscape and leaving the impressions of their feet, more fragile than in lava, but still going to last quite a long time, uh, we hope. So they're kind of like bookending a very particular um, physical and cultural trajectory which takes humans from the surface of the earth and up into space and who knows where after that. So let's have a think about the heritage significance of the Apollo 11 landing site a little bit more and I'm not going to look at all of them uh, particularly because the historic significance is perhaps very accessible and easy to understand but let's think about the scientific significance. So this image you see here is all six Apollo 11 landing sites. Apologies, I don't know why the slides are randomly leaping ahead like that. Um, maybe I inadvertently built a timer in. Um, so all six Apollo uh, sites, which are imaged by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And just looking at them in a very cursory way in this image, uh, you can see that they progressively get larger in size over time. The astronauts venture further away from the landing modules themselves. And in the later missions, the last three missions, they actually had lunar rovers. So they were able to drive a fair distance from the sites. They also spent longer on the moon in each one. And what we see if we compare these six sites is a growing familiarity with the lunar environment. So each mission would have learnt from the, the crew that went on the previous mission. All of the engineers and technologists would have learnt lessons from the previous missions to apply to the new ones. So we're seeing in a very brief period of six years a process of adaptation to the lunar environment. And surprisingly, no one has ever actually studied this. I would do it myself, but there's so much going on in space archaeology, I've never had time to do it. So we haven't yet learned the lessons that we can learn by looking at these places as material evidence of human adaptation in the way an archaeologist would. And this is something I think we could learn a lot from as missions are being planned to return to the lunar surface, even as we speak. So that's an aspect of the scientific significance of these sites. You might not think that the moon would have much to offer in the way of aesthetic significance, and I would argue you'd be wrong. So the more time I spend looking at all of the images that were taken by the Apollo 11 crew, the more I'm struck by something that's both a presence and an absence. It's the shadow astronauts and the shadow spacecraft and experiments that appear in many of these images. The one you see on the left here is from Apollo uh, 12, I think, and you have a, a, a beautiful little experiment. It sort of looks like a little stick insect uh, casting its shadow, maybe like a praying mantis uh, in the middle of the picture. And then you have uh, the astronaut, uh, a, a shadow selfie. The astronaut is photographing the lunar soil um, you can see their arms held up against their face and, and they're holding an instrument which, uh, you know, almost looks like a net about to catch our little praying mantis. So the image shows an astronaut who isn't there. And when I think of these sites, I, I do still kind of imagine that the shadows are there, even though they obviously can't be. Uh, the aesthetic quality of these shadows reminds me very much of a series of paintings made by the Italian artist Giorgio de Chirico uh, in, in the early 1900s. He, he moved to Florence and he started making a series of paintings uh, that is uh, uh, in, in a theme with the one you see here, the Enigma of Day. These paintings showed um, strange lights, empty town squares, elongated shadows, 
uh, perspectives and architectures that kind of seem a bit unnatural and jarring to the eye. And art critics who know far more about this than me say that the, the paintings deliberately evoke a series of melancholy and reflection and perhaps even despair. Not that I want to say Apollo 11 reflects despair, but I think there's an element of, of loneliness in these images, uh, these two men with the third Michael Collins orbiting the moon all by himself, uh, roaming the lunar landscape as, as the only people present. And the shadow images to me uh, really have a strong emotional resonance. The people cast in these shadows are no longer there, but the shadows cast by the actual space site hardware is still there, and I think is part of their aesthetic significance. These, for me, Luna 2 and Apollo 11 are two of the most interesting archaeological sites on the moon, but we're soon to get another one. So this has been in the news the last week. In 2015, uh, a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket sent a scientific satellite uh, out to orbit in one of the stable Lagrange points around the moon. And this rocket body has been bouncing around between lunar and Earth orbit uh, ever since. Uh, a very keen-eyed um, spacecraft and asteroid observer noticed that its orbit was changing and that it would perhaps likely uh, crash into the moon on the 4th of March. So this is future archaeology. This is an archaeological site that hasn't yet even been created. A lot of people are saying, you know, this is evidence of, of humanity's lack of regard for the lunar environment. And I think there is uh, a lot to be said for this argument. And I think it's very uh, telling that after decades of considering the moon as a dead world that we don't have to have any regard for or any responsibility towards, that attitudes towards this are changing. So the Falcon 9 rocket is, is uncontrolled uh, and it will crash wherever it crashes onto the moon. It's probably going to be the far side of the moon and on the far side of the moon there are only two human landing sites. One is Ranger 2 from 1962 and the other one is Chaga 4 and the U-22 U2 rover, which is currently still working. So while it's statistically unlikely to hit either of these sites, uh, it could actually um, cause a little bit of dust damage. And in fact, dust damage is one of the most serious aspects of lunar surface activities, which might be a threat to all of these heritage sites. So for a long time, nobody went to the moon. There was nothing much going on the moon. So all of these extraordinary places were protected quite easily because there were no threats other than the natural environment. That's all changing now. So there are at least nine missions being planned to the moon. They want to go and stay on the surface and use local resources in what's called in situ resource utilization to build habitats, to create uh, other resources such as propellant, which they'll make from the water ice, and possibly even to get resources that might have some value on Earth. So all of these scientific and industrial activities are planned. At some point, there may even be tourism to the moon. I'm not holding my breath on this one, but it's, it's possible, maybe in the next 50 years. Certainly there's going to be more people on the moon and one of the first things people do is go and souvenir things from existing sites. And the market value of original Apollo or any other of those uh, places on Earth in the space collecting market would be enormous. So we would be developing possibly an antiquities trade uh, or a contemporary antiquities trade to rival the black market in ancient antiquities. And this is something that I think we need to be cognizant of. And certainly a lot of the scientific missions will be planning to sample the previous sites because there's valuable scientific information to be gained. And at the moment, there doesn't seem to be any plan for this. This is something I am actually working on um, as part of my other lunar activities. So these sites have been safe for a long time. For, the Apollo sites have been safe for 50 years, but that's about to change. And dust is a very major factor in this. So we do often think of the Apollo astronauts as roaming around the lunar landscape in their blinding white spacesuits, 
But in actual fact, they started to get dirty from the minute they stepped onto the lunar regolith. So uh, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong had dirty boots pretty much from the word go. The picture here shows you Harrison Schmidt, who was on the Apollo 17 mission. He was actually a geologist, a trained geologist, and the first uh, actual scientist to get to the moon. And he's just covered in dust. It's like, you know, someone's thrown him down and rolled him in it. And what they, the astronauts noted about the dust was that it was very sticky. It stuck to everything. It could stick to instrument faces and prevent you from reading them. It could start to erode the all-important seals, which keep space suits airtight. Uh, if you breathed it in, it was very abrasive and nasty. In fact, it can be quite toxic. And it could stop mechanisms. It could clog up mechanisms, uh, mechanical um, installations, and stop them from working. So John Young from the Apollo 16 mission said that dust was the number one concern in returning to the moon. This is something you won't necessarily see mentioned in news stories about future lunar missions, but there are a lot of scientists working on trying to solve the dust problem. So in order to get around this, some of the strategies that have been proposed are that new lunar infrastructure like habitations, uh, scientific instrumentation, uh, mineral processing factories are located in places where they are, for example, far from some of the lunar heritage sites or where there are natural barriers like mountain ranges and boulders that will prevent the transport of dust. It may even be necessary to build blast walls uh, to stop the dust from traveling around uh, the planet, the moon. And a key factor in this will be making stable surfaces for rocket takeoffs and landings. What we do know from the Apollo missions is that every piece of rocket exhaust blows huge quantities of dust around. And it's possible this could even be lofted into lunar orbit and form a, a cloud around the moon. That would be great. So there are creative and technological solutions to stirring up lunar dust. And it is very abrasive. It's full of tiny, tiny uh, little obsidian particles. We know from when Apollo 11, uh, Apollo 12 visited the Surveyor 3 site and removed some material and took it back to Earth, that even in two years, the, the natural dust movement on the moon and the effect of the Apollo 12 landing nearby uh, actually caused quite a significant amount of dust abrasion. So in 2011, uh, with the help of my colleague, Beth Laura O'Leary, uh, NASA put together some recommendations for anyone going to the surface of the moon to try and avoid damage to all of the sites, US sites particularly, but this could apply to any site. Their main recommendation from this was setting up buffer zones around the heritage sites, inside which you should not ideally go, and recommending patterns of overflight so that, again, rocket exhaust didn't stir up dust which abraded the surfaces. So we actually have a good starting point for protecting the lunar heritage, but these guidelines are quite old now and are probably going to need updating very soon. Fortunately, there's currently a huge amount of interest in the archaeological record of the moon and its role is, as being the cultural heritage of humanity in space. There's a big emphasis on using space sustainably and cultural heritage is seen as part of that sustainable use of space. The Hague Working Group, which a few years ago put out a set of principles for using space sustainably, has included cultural and natural heritage uh, in those principles. Uh, in 2019, the US released its Artemis Accords, and cultural heritage is a, one of the key seven uh, principles in the Accords. So we have a lot of interest in uh, what's going to happen to the archaeological record on the moon and fortunately a lot of um, willingness to engage with heritage ideas around what these sites mean. Uh, I've been working with the Global Expert Group on Sustainable Lunar Activities, also known as GEGSLA, which is an initiative of the Moon Village Association, and we're specifically working on strategies to make sure that this incredible heritage isn't lost, you know, in a, a moment of someone just taking an unplanned uh, lunar ride, rover ride um, past the Apollo sites, for example. And we will be putting in place protocols for safely and 
uh, scientifically justifiable ways of removing samples from some of these existing sites. So there's a lot of uh, effort and thought at the moment around the archaeological record on the moon. And just uh, another interesting piece of news, just uh, last year, uh, the United Nations declared July 20th, the anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing, to be International Moon Day. So this year will be the first, day, first year that there's uh, a kind of an international uh, celebration around this day. And one of the purposes of the day is to emphasise the importance of su sustainable lunar exploration and utilisation. So that's fun to put into your calendars. So I think I'm nearly uh, out of time. So I want to finish this talk by drawing on uh, one of my favourite space poets. Something that you learn when you're in the space world or working in space industry is that sometimes the people who are closest to space, who, the astronauts who have lived in space, who have walked on the moon, are not the best people to actually describe their experience. Often they're military people or engineers. Uh, they have um, a particular ways of describing and looking at the world. And sometimes you want to know more. So I think poets have a huge role and artists to play in recasting these places for us, in making more connections between humans on Earth and these places in space that we're coming to know through all of the images and data that we're, we're acquiring from these space missions. So to finish in the words of the poet Christine Reuter, one day it happens, you find yourself on the moon looking back at Earth. Thank you. I'll now return my screen. Uh, oh, I'll turn my screen or the uh, our technical support will turn the screen. Uh, so I'm glad that CG was paying attention. I was completely engrossed. In that. Uh, um, so, so yes, you can imagine there is so much more I could say about all of that stuff. But I think we have some time for questions now. Yes, we absolutely do. Um, we've had a few come in. Uh, um, yeah, I think we'll bring the first one up. So I suppose this kind of ties in with what you were talking about right at the start of the lecture. Um, so the moon itself has a, a common kind of global cultural significance. Um, and even though the moon landings are relatively recent, does that significance add extra challenges to carrying out kind of digs on the surface that might, well, potential future digs, I suppose? Uh, that's, that's a really interesting question. I mean, normally on Earth, when archaeologists are working past sites, uh, there, there are stakeholders and community, contemporary communities who right. have connections to these places. But with some of these lunar sites, we are literally talking the whole world because you can regard them as national heritage, uh, but you can also regard them as, as, as global or world heritage. So it's a pretty big stakeholder community. And, yes, there is a challenge um, in making sure, you know, one of the, the most important principles of cultural heritage management is uh, involving stakeholders in decisions. Mm -hmm. And you might think that uh, most people would uh, think that many of these sites are incredibly significant and we should keep them. But not everyone thinks that. And those people have a right to have a view as well. So, so yes, there are challenges in appropriately consulting uh, about uh, the, the future of these sites. Uh, you could also say, I mean, one of the benefits of working in the contemporary past mm -hmm is unlike the more ancient past, we have all the documents. Well, that's yeah. not entirely true. We don't have all the documents, but we have a huge quantity of documents and we can talk to people. So we have such a wealth of information about these places. Having said that, documents don't tell you everything mm -hmm. and documents don't necessarily tell you the truth, whatever that is. And people's memories are fallible. Every, every person has their experience from a particular yep. point in time and perspective. So, so merely having the people in the documents doesn't necessarily tell you what happened. Sometimes only the place or the material can give you an alternative perspective on that. But I don't want to encourage anyone to think that archaeology can find the truth. We can find out a lot of stuff, but maybe truth isn't among those things. And so much of it is coloured by sort of people's perceptions of what happened or what didn't happen or uh, that, that kind of narrative. So thank exactly. you. I think we've got another couple of questions. So one from YouTube here. So Lisa asks, could the moon be inscribed on the World Heritage List and should it? Very interesting question. So unfortunately at the moment, 
uh, the World Heritage List can't be applied to space because the places places inscribed on the World Heritage List have to be within national boundaries and the right. nomination has to be put forward by a nation state. According to the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, uh, no one can own space. So there is no body who could put forward a nomination for a place on the moon. Having said that, though, the Outer Space Treaty and other treaties make clear that objects launched into space remain the property of the launching state. Yes, and they're responsible so, for it as well. That They are liable for damage mm -hmm. caused. So SpaceX or the US will be liable if the Falcon 9 booster rocket lands on top of Chang'e 4, someone is going to have to pay. Um, but uh, the objects can be listed on national heritage registers. So uh, there's two lunar rovers and the, the um, objects at Apollo 11 have actually been listed on state lists in the US. But that's not the site. That's no. only the object. So it's an interesting distinction. As for the whole moon, uh, it has... Uh, intangible, incredible intangible uh, cultural value mm -hmm. as well. Um, I don't think, again, a nation state would have to prom to initiate inscription and it would have to be considered within that nation's borders. And if a nation considered that to be the case, then they could start a nomination process. It would probably be thrown out. Mm -hmm. But there might be other creative ways to think of the whole moon as a cultural object. Uh, uh, I don't know what they are just now, but obviously this is not going to be a one-off thing. You know, we have a whole solar system full of bodies yep. that humans are forming different kinds of relationships with. So thinking through these issues, I think, is actually an important way to kind of understand our future engagement with the rest of the solar system. Yeah, especially because there's sites, you know, you've, or you've even got kind of Cassini evaporating in Saturn's atmosphere sort of where yeah. do you where do you stop place. yes exactly yeah that's a fantastic question thank you Lisa um I think we've got another few so Joe asks does industrialization of the moon concern you so is there a risk that mass mining could over time affect the moon's orbit or relationship to the earth in any way and thank you for the great presentation it was a phenomenal lecture <laughs> thank you Joe uh the good news is that you would have to remove such a huge quantity of the moon to alter its orbit uh, that that's not going to happen. In fact, the moon is moving away from Earth ever so slightly every year. So that, relation, that relationship is, is changing. Mm -hmm. But lunar mining is not going to be one of the causes of making a difference to that. So that's the good news. But having said that, yes, the industrialisation of the moon does concern me. I mean, I, I, I want people to go to the moon I'm sure those people are never going to be me, but I want to find out more about the moon. I am concerned the current tenor of the discourse, I guess you could say, first of all, people are talking about it as if it's inevitable. It isn't inevitable. Which, no, not at all. Not at all. Uh, and people are also talking about, about it. It's like mining on Earth 50 years ago. So so there are people, and, and I say this uh with a lot of respect, because I work with with people in this sector. So, so, um, and I mean, I spend a lot of time working in the mining sector on Earth myself. So, but um, there's there's sort of often you will get a slight hint of outrage that anyone would dare put obstacles in the way of using the moon for whatever purpose in whatever way that people want. People don't think like that on Earth anymore. It's been a long time since people thought it was okay to just go and rip stuff out of the Earth. I'm not saying terrestrial environmental impact processes are perfect. They're absolutely not perfect, but they are a framework that, that provides at least some checks and balances. And we haven't quite got to that point on the moon yet, even though there are a lot of people working on these issues. So that's also the good news. Yeah, I'm very concerned that the industrialization of the moon doesn't destroy uh, the cultural heritage and the natural heritage that, that the moon, you know, doesn't end up being a completely different kind of object. Um, mm -hmm. Because, we, you know, we'll never get it back. We will never get back the moon that we once had. And that deserves a lot of serious thought. No, absolutely. It's the, the kind of impact we've been looking at it and observing it, you know, some of the earliest calendars or lunar calendars, we know that it's been part of our heritage mm -hmm. for that long. So, no, absolutely. Changing how we view it is, is quite, quite alarming. Um, thank you, Joe, for that one. 
Um, so as uh -huh. space is such a harsh environment, is there a sense of urgency to conserve the Apollo site? So I know like the, the flags are now white from yeah. kind of solar radiation and things like that. It is, it's true. It, it is a very harsh environment. The moon is constantly bombarded by cosmic rays, high energy particles, solar flares, uh, very high UV, extreme temperature mm -hmm. changes, all of those things. So it is a harsh environment. From my perspective, though, I see a big difference between um, natural decay. So that's that's kind of what the moon is. And if we put stuff on the moon, then that's kind of what we expect to happen. So so. I don't mind that. I'm kind of okay for them to sort of decay. Uh, we might want to do a bit more study first. Mm -hmm. We might want to do a bit more archaeology. Um, I guess I'm more concerned with the stuff we can do something about, and that is lunar surface activities and industrialization. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, I mean, some of the newer technologies we have about this stuff involve, you know, digital reconstruction. And uh, this is interesting too, because uh, you know one of the important things about archaeology and heritage is that it, it is about physical objects and places, and um, nothing can replace those. But you can you can offer alternatives for for again allowing people to to build relationships and have their own attachments. So there's probably a lot of creative stuff we can do. Uh, we, you know, we might have like Chauvet Cave, we might have a, a replica digital Apollo 11 that you could study as if it were the real site itself. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of okay. I, I don't, I'm not that worried about, you know, the sites gradually wearing away through all of these natural processes. I suppose that, you know, the, the wearing away tells us more about the environment of space where we're kind of learning from that. That gradual That's decay. true. And it also tells us something about our knowledge of the space environment at the time those objects were made as well. So, mm -hmm. so their condition uh, actually becomes part of the, the kind of scientific um, experiment as well, the social experiment in the sense that they reflect changing states of knowledge. Okay, so we don't need to rush back. That's <laughs> good to know. Uh, I think we've got another few questions. Um, Ah, that's a good, good question. So I've seen it suggested that the Apollo 11 ascent module still survives in a stable orbit around the moon. If it survives, is it safer left in orbit or better recovered and studied as archaeology? This is an interesting one because uh, archaeologically you would love to have it and do all of the studies you can do on it. In heritage terms, it's better left where it is, even if that stable orbits are a bit hard to come by around the moon. <laughs> So they're probably all over time um, move into more unstable regimes. So it might go off somewhere or crash somewhere in the meantime. From a heritage perspective, things are better left in their natural setting where they were. But, you know, it would be hard to say I wouldn't love somebody to turn up at my lab door one day and say, here, have this ascent module. Uh, you can study in any way you want. I mean, that would be pretty tempting. That's, yeah, I think it'd be hard to say no to that one. <laughs> Um, I think we've got another few. So Mr. K. Barr asks, can I ask how can we find solutions to the dust problem uh, we have on the moon, uh, if there are any? I know we've had some speakers from NASA talk about just how much of a challenge it is. Mm. Uh, yeah, fortunately, we have some amazing scientists working on this problem. And in fact, in Australia, we've just set up a, a CSIRO, has set up a laboratory using a lunar soil simulant to work on it as well. So some of the solutions are having coatings, which will repel the very adhesive dust. Um, people like Phil Metzger, who, who from Swamp Works in um, the US, um, has been doing experiments on sintering the regolith, which were consolidated. I don't think they've been, uh, they've been successful, but, but I, I think sintering isn't something yet we can do over a large area. Um, and there's, yeah, it is such a problem uh, that there are a lot of people working on um, surface, different surfaces, spacecraft design, uh, a huge amount of experiments with different kinds. Because, of course, the other problem is we have very limited qualities of actual lunar dust <laughs> to play with on Earth. Um, there, there's a huge range of sort of official simulants, mm -hmm. but most of them will simulate, say, mechanical properties or chemical properties or textual properties. It's a bit hard to get everything into the one. Yep. But, um, yeah, uh, there's certainly a lot of work going on around this problem. And I think the 
the state of, I mean, when you listen to, to all of these companies and agencies talk, you know, we're going to be on the moon tomorrow. Um, and tomorrow we won't have solved the dust problem. It's going to take a bit longer than that. So I think there's a little bit of a, a sort of a mismatch in the timing uh, for some for future missions. Okay. Am I right in thinking it's it's partly down to it's sort of electrostatic properties that's that's the big challenge? It just won't yep. come off. Yep. <laughs> it sticks. It absolutely sticks. And there's some suggestion that um, on the far side of the moon, it's even stickier. So I don't know why, but yeah, so it's got different qualities of stickiness, um, and yeah, it's 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 very abrasive. It sticks. It's it's toxic if you breathe it in. Uh, it's not. It's it's yeah. It's fairly. But that that this is a large part of the moon. The lunar surface mm -hmm. is is this dust. So so I don't know. I'm sure there's also ways of. It would just be interesting to stop thinking about it as the enemy and think about it as. Well, as as what you've got to work with, so I'm trying to take part of the situation. And um, there are lots of people also working on using the dust as a building material, as a construction material, particularly with 3D printing it and a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, and now, um, so there are there are oxygen and hydrogen molecules bound up in the dust. So there's also the possibility of extracting uh, water, uh, which everybody wants on the moon. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, it's not it's not um, it's not all all of a bad thing it's just it's a it's an environment that we're not used to on earth hopefully it'll stop being the the enemy um i think we've got another couple of questions uh so chloe's asking is there any reason i haven't been back to the moon for a landing gosh i mean because there was such a long time i i once made a long chronology of lunar missions there's a period of about i don't know 30 or 40 years where you have the odd uh orbiting mission um, a couple of surface missions, no crewed missions mm. for such a long time. And then suddenly, bam, like everybody wants to do it, like, which is an extraordinary change. Um, and I'm not, yeah, I don't, I'm not entirely sure why this is. But just think back, you know, even, I don't know, maybe even three years, three or four years ago, this wasn't on the agenda. Mm -hmm. The moon was just you know, one of, of all of the solar system bodies that people were interested in, I, I, I kind of, I'm not too keen to kind of promote the ideas of new space races and all of that kind of stuff, but there's definitely an element of one-upmanship in this as well. Yep. So, so you know, nobody can be left out of getting back to the moon. So I'm sure that's part of it, but I'm not quite sure why the tipping point sort of came now and not earlier or later. I guess another aspect is, you know, the growing influence of the, the big uh, private space corporations. So I don't know. I think there'll be some space historians and space power theorists who will look back on this period with, uh, you know, a, more information and, and a bit more perspective than arts who will be able to say, well, this is what the hell was going on because something is going on, isn't it? Yeah, um, absolutely. And I, I, yeah, I feel like the privatization of space or some aspects of space launches is is definitely a big, a big one. Because mm -hmm. if it was just, you know, if it's just government powers, then yeah, wouldn't people don't get a say. Life. But yeah, it's yeah. it's an interesting, interesting period to be interested in in space. Um, I think, thank you for that, Chloe. That was a really good one. Um, so I suppose this is one for you, um, kind of for your interest specifically. Beyond the moon, is there any site or artifact in the solar system that you'd most want to kind of investigate either in situ or, or kind of get your hands on it on a <sighs> that yeah there's you know we spent today on the moon but there's so much stuff in the rest of the solar system i suppose yeah if i if i had a choice um it would be uh, voyager 2 uh, so Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 both launched in 1977 and both currently in interstellar space. Uh, Voyager 1 got to interstellar space first, so people kind of forget a bit about Voyager 2 because it trailed behind. Um, but Voyager 2 brought us the first images of all the sort of um, middle and outer solar system planets. Of course, they have the famous golden records on them, and those are such interesting objects for a million different reasons. <laughs> But I would, what I would like to do is look at all of the little 
corners and nooks and crannies in the Voyager 2 spacecraft and look at how dust has accumulated in them from its journey from Earth. So it's, you know, it was in a clean room originally, um, but, you know, then it was taken to the launch pad. It would have acquired some little bits, little tiny dust grains along the way. Then it's going through Earth orbit. Maybe it picked up some little tiny grains of decaying satellites or, or rockets as or fuel as it went through. Then it... it takes its journey all the way through the solar system to interstellar space. So I have this little vision that there's some a little corner inside all of the, the, the complexity of the spacecraft where you will get layers and layers, microscopic layers of all of the different dusts that it's passed through. And I would love to, to excavate, do a micro, uh, a nano excavation <laughs> on that those layers. Uh, to see how that journey is represented uh, in in dust. So, yeah, that would be my top choice. That's incredibly poetic. <laughs> I think that's, yeah, they're, they're amazing spacecraft and, and yeah, sort of to, to be able to tell the, the story of their, their journey out into the, yeah. the solar I'm system. Glad you're reading them. you want to do it too now, don't you? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I think we've got about one time for one more question. Um, so to anyone thinking that space archaeology might be the career for them, if you've just encountered space archaeology as a career uh, and you want to, to, to get into that, what would be your advice? Well, there's currently no specific jobs for space archaeology, but it is my expectation that at some point in the future, uh, these space companies and agencies will have to get, for example, heritage assessments done mm -hmm. of, of sites that are in the, the vicinity of their safety zones or working areas. So I expect that there will be jobs in the future. So you need an archaeology degree. And uh, this is uh, as much to develop an understanding of archaeological ethics. Um, just an example of that is an archaeologist would never remove or steal an artifact from a site. That sounds pretty basic, but people pick up stuff all the time. An archaeologist will never do that because it destroys the integrity of the site and it becomes second nature. So, so that's... A very simple example for a complex subject, but having the archaeology degree so you know the methods and the theories and the ethics is really important. Then the second thing is you need the scientific background. So I'm kind of lucky. I did at uh, you know at high school and my undergraduate days, I, I probably did more hard science, you know, than the average archaeologist. Archaeology is you know is very um, about this stuff these days anyway. But you do need that background. Like, so I have to read um, papers full of equations about astrodynamics and, and, you know, the chemical composition of Venus and stuff like that. So you have to be able to understand that literature as well. So I guess the, the sort of the ideal situation is an archaeology degree augmented by a, 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 a postgraduate or another um, undergraduate degree that gives you the space background too. Um, something I've found a huge benefit because I have worked in heritage management in terrestrial mm -hmm. mining is just understanding how that industry works. I mean, that's not something, well, you can actually, there are degrees you can do and that sort of thing. But having that kind of understanding has been really critical, I think, to being able to communicate this stuff across um, people from all different sectors involved in space. Um, so, so perhaps unlike other kinds of archaeology, uh, you, yeah, you have to have um, a slightly different technical background. I mean, you could do it the other way around as well. You don't have to start with the archaeology degree, but that would be absolutely essential. And hopefully, if you're just starting out on this path, by the time you finish all of this, there will be, SpaceX will be advertising for its, um, you know, um, heritage liaison officer or its director of space heritage. So there will be those jobs out there. That's a, a big fingers crossed. Yeah, it's uh, just so interesting to hear about kind of with space archaeology, the, the kind of really human side of of what can sometimes be quite a, a sort of cold subject. So yeah, that was phenomenal. Thank you so much. Um, I think we are just about out of time. And the nod uh, from my producer. So 
just left to me to say a huge thank you to all of our audience for joining us tonight. I think we had over 170 people watching uh, at one time, which was incredible. Um, and a huge thank you to you, uh, Dr. Gorman, for actually delivering such an incredible lecture and, and answering so many questions. Um, if anyone watching tonight would like more information on upcoming lectures, please do head to the GSC website. Um, we've got a planetary mailing list. We'd like to keep you up to date with anything that's upcoming. Um, and of course, we're keen, we've had lots of lovely comments uh, from everyone that's come in, but we're really keen to get your feedback from this lecture series. Uh, so please do take a moment to let us know what you think uh, at the link below, uh, which our moderators will pop in and should be on the YouTube page. Um, but yeah, just to say again, a massive thank you. Uh, and I do hope you have a lovely rest of your day because it is, sort of what eight o'clock in the morning for you now <laughs> well, I'm going to go and have breakfast now but thank you so much for having me it was lovely to have this opportunity to engage uh with the uh, Glasgow Science Centre and David Elder Lecture audience so um I've had a lovely time too thank you wonderful and hopefully we'll, we'll be seeing Glasgow uh, at some point in the future um but yeah so thank you everyone uh, have a really lovely morning uh, and good night to the rest of you thank you all so much for joining us <laughs>